Hi, Rob Stoller here for Pivot Entertainment. Pleased to present another installment from Jim Sheeler's book, Obit, featuring ordinary people who led extraordinary lives. Today's installment, Life's Lessons Learned Too Soon, about Daniel Seltzer. At the top of the page, the title is scrawled in the impulsive script of a 14-year-old boy, Code of Morals. Near the bottom of the page is a signature, Daniel Seltzer, 52498. Between them, words to live by and to leave behind. Number one, all moral decisions should be weighed by determining if the overall benefits outweigh the costs. I found the list in his drawer while I was going through his room, said Fern Seltzer, as she looked over the words scribbled on notebook paper in her son Daniel's handwriting. Occasionally he would refer to these, she said. He would recite them from memory. He put a lot of effort into them. Number two, religion only brings about hatred, war, and conflict, never peace or unity. His code of morals includes the words of great thinkers and some of his own, adopted and narrowed down to ten guidelines. The list was not completed for a class. Nobody told him to write it. As with most of Daniel Seltzer's passions, it was sparked by a searing quest for knowledge, a search that would pile a lifetime of learning into a body that was never old enough to drive a car. Daniel Seltzer died suddenly and unexpectedly at home, February 13, 1999, of complications from a previously undetected heart condition. He was 15. Number three, never allow fear to run one's life. Born in Oregon, Daniel Seltzer moved with his family to Denver when he was an infant. He crawled at six months, walked at ten months, and could identify the alphabet before he was two. He began reading to himself shortly afterward. His favorite book in kindergarten was Judy Bloom's Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. He was, his mother said, in a hurry. Number four, inanimate objects are never inherently good or evil. On Daniel Seltzer's bookshelf are his mother's copies of plays by Euripides and Dante's Paradiso, along with his own fantasy books and science fiction collections from Isaac Asimov. Nearby rests an autographed copy of a program from a Central City Opera production of The Barber of Seville. In front of his room are certificates from the Odyssey of the Mind competition. Above the bed in his room hang two plaques from the University of Denver's Rocky Mountain Talent Search, recognizing Daniel's score of 1,500 on the scholastic aptitude test out of a possible 1,600 at the age of 13. On his bed is a well-worn, tattered teddy bear. A beautiful adult mind, one of his school counselors wrote about Daniel, in the body of a magical little boy. Number five, no one's own limitations. Gene Strop remembers walking into Cherry Creek High School with Daniel when he was a student at Cherry Hills Village Elementary School, and she was his teacher in the gifted and talented student program. Daniel wanted to build a laser. He was one of those kids who from early on I expected to do great things, that he would solve some problem that would change the world, someone who would make some contribution, Strop said. He was pretty intense at learning, mastering, doing well. He had big plans. I think he was a great observer of life, she said after reading his code of morals. He was a special soul. Number six, simple things have simple answers. Complex things have complex answers. Daniel Seltzer's music collection spanned the centuries but rarely made it to the 20th. His appreciation for opera and live theater continued to widen until a week before his death, when he attended a Denver Center Theater Company production of The Rivals with his father. Afterward, he devoured the script. Two years ago, he saw the opera Don Giovanni. We had to go to the library and check out both versions of Don Giovanni on videotape. We had to go buy the CD. We had to have the cassette tapes, Fern Seltzer said. We listened to Don Giovanni 10 hours a day. He sat there with the libretto and followed along in Italian. I'm sorry to say he could not sing. We were sitting there one time on the couch watching The Marriage of Figaro, and he was sitting next to me, croaking along. 
It was so horrible sounding, but it was also so cute. He knew that libretto, too. Instead of doing his homework, he sat up learning the libretto. In school, his classes were advanced. Still, his parents say he often struggled to balance schoolwork with his true passions. It didn't interest him to have all A's. He just felt that he wanted to learn, and it didn't matter if it was something that was directly applicable to school, his mother said. I do wonder if somehow he knew his time was limited. Number seven, only perform desperate measures when in desperate situations. As she stood near the corner of her son's bed, Fern Seltzer remembered the last morning of Daniel's life. He had been home with a mild case of the flu. As she sat at his bedside, there was no way to know that his heart was failing. He had a structural heart defect. If he hadn't have gotten the flu, he presumably wouldn't have died now, but would have later. The coroner told me there were only 40 cases of this in medical literature. If we had known about it, the only thing that would have saved him would have been a heart transplant, but there was no way to know that he needed one. She paused. It's hard to come to terms with that. Number eight, never allow anger to cloud one's own judgment. When he was eight months old, Daniel was underneath the sink unscrewing pipes. At a year old, he was taking apart cameras. He turned off the escalators at department stores and pulled the fire alarm at school. Once, he ran off inside an airport and almost boarded a plane to Newark. Diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, the adult mind and the little boy's body could often make for more than a handful. He was just very determined, his mother said, and of course that made him difficult. It also, however, made for stirring moments of joy, his parents say, such as the time when Daniel, as a very young boy, first saw the U.S. Capitol. It wasn't just child's excitement, it was a different kind of excitement, his father said. He appreciated where he was. He appreciated what it meant. Number nine, people are, despite all their faults, inherently good. Daniel's computer was an older model, long past obsolescence. Instead of buying a new one, the boy preferred the challenge of continually upgrading the machine by himself. He had, after all, been playing with computers since he was two years old. He'd have his thumb in his mouth and would bob up and down typing words, said Roger, his father. That's a very vivid memory. Part of that was just the sheer determination. He just loved the computer, even at that age. For years, he helped people with computer problems and had began a business capitalizing on his talent. Early on, he didn't take a fee, his mother said, just milk and cookies. During the few years before his death, he built friendships on the Internet, particularly with groups of people involved in fantasy role-playing games. In tribute to him, friends devoted a website to him. He always commented on my ideas and stories when everyone else could care less, wrote a friend that Daniel never met in person. He was always nice to me, and for that I thank him. As a memento, I'm going to leave him on my contact list as long as I can. The only thing that can delete him is if my computer crashes. Number 10. Remember, but do not worship the past. Live for, but not only for, the present. And prepare for, but do not panic over, the future. Number 10 was initially the last of Daniel's codes, followed by his signature and the date, 52498. Two weeks before his 15th birthday, he decided to add one more. Number 11, nothing is of more importance than love. Thank you.